Hey, oh, happy bio. Hey, welcome to day 76. Uh, we're going to take a look at the true cost of meat as part of our eco issues projects for the wrap up of the year here, right? Oh, man. Look at that burger. I just like to wrap my stoma all around it. Now, the typical, of course, classic American meal is the hamburger. And it's such a favorite dish of humans that, like this cheeseburger right here. Oh, look at that cheese and that big old fat patty dripping with the delicious fats. That has become basically a moneymaker for things like McDonald's, right? You know, over 10 billion, jillion, trillion burgers sold now. I don't know how many it is. It was in the billions when I was a kid. Uh, if we look at this, the other thing that was part of it when I was a kid was this cool character called the Hamburglar. And uh, he's gone extinct, but the Hamburglar, of course, was a burglar. He used to steal burgers and stuff. And if you don't recognize the purple guy, that's Grimace. Um, I don't know what Grimace was, maybe a gumdrop or something. But he was always smiling. Go figure, right? The question I always ask students is, uh, what's the Hamburglar really burgling? And another way to look at that is basically this. What does it take to make a hamburger? Because they don't just fall out of the sky, right? What really goes into making a hamburger? What's the true cost, right? So pause it, write down the question, try to guess what actually goes into making a burger, and then we'll figure it out together. All right? You can see other great characters uh, like that creepy clown thing. And then that right there, that little chicken, that's Nugget. <laughs> I wonder what she turns into. It was simpler times back then, but people at least understood their food better, right? Cool. Let's try it together. I'll get rid of my big, ugly head. Now, if we, of course... Try to figure out what it takes to make a hamburger. The first thing we should draw is a really bad hamburger. So I got myself a nice big burger, right? Ooh, it's got some cheese on it. Maybe we'll make it a double, triple stack. Let's just make it a quarter pounder, right? A classic American thing. Throw some lettuce on there, some good old whip together, uh, salt and sugar and some umami, you know, ketchup, Chinese word for sauce. And if we look at that, of course, there's my classic American cheeseburger. And today, we're not even going to worry about all the cheese and the accoutrements and all that stuff. We're just going to worry about the thing that makes it, you know, American's favorite, which this is an all-beef patty, right? And, of course, if it's beef, that means that it's a very special type of meat. It's red meat. It's one of the ones that uh, humans crave the most because it's so loaded with energy and flavor, right? And let's say, let's say, just to keep the math simple, that this is a really big burger. This is like a one-pound beef patty, right? No quarter pounders here, you're going for the quadruple stack, right? You know, like a pound of beef that you buy at the store. So in order to have that pound of beef, well, there's some things that have to go into that, right? Now, we like beef as a culture because in America, of course, it's flavorful. But to do that, you have to have a cow. Now, fortunately for me, I grew up on a farm where we raise beef cattle. So I have a pretty good idea how this works. You don't just want any type of cow, right? You want the ultimate tasty fatty beef producer, and that is what's called Angus. You know, Black Angus. Come on down to Black Angus. This Angus beef, of course, would uh, be one of the best because it's got so much fats in it and lots of protein they grow really big. So let's say we're looking at the average Angus beef cattle, right? And if we look at this Angus, he's going to be heavy. He's going to be like a ton. So let's say that, to keep it simple, it's about 2,000-pound animal, right? You're going to need to, of course, create this cow and give it alive, right? The cows will make themselves, but, you know, there's artificial insemination involved in that. But the key thing is you got to keep it alive and get it to grow so it can become hamburgers, right? So one thing it's going to need is going to need feed, right? And on average, of course, to feed this thing, well, what we're going to need is what we typically use now. Most Angus beef, unless you pay for the really high-grade stuff, is not free-ranging, living on grass and things like that. It's living in a factory because that's more efficient. You can make greater profit for it. And then the food just comes by and it's mostly corn, right? And in some places they used to feed them other parts of cows. But that's another story. To feed just one pound of the beef, how many pounds of corn feed would it require? Well, people get a lot, guess lots of things in class, but basically I'll tell you this. It takes 6.7 pounds of feed just to build that one pound of meat, right? That doesn't sound like a lot until you realize, okay, that's a 2,000-pound cow. I got to multiply this times 2,000 pounds to make the whole cow because you can't just have a patty walking around, right? 
And that means it's going to come out to about 13,400 pounds of feed that that pound of beef is going to need for a given amount of time, for keeping it simple, right? Now that starts to add up. That's a lot of corn, right? Now, the other part of this course is it's an animal and it's cells are full of water, so it's going to need water. How many gallons of water would it need for just that pound of beef? Well, it's just a pound of beef. It can't be that thirsty, right? It's like one or two, ten? Well, it's actually 52.8 gallons of water just to, of course, grow the cow for that one pound of beef, right? Now, you multiply that times the 2,000 pounds of this Angus beef cattle, right? That comes out to 105,600 gallons of water in a given amount of time just to support that whole cow so you can have that one pound of beef. So 52.8 gallons builds up over time. That's a lot of the most precious thing on earth called, you know, water you can actually drink. There's lots of salt water on earth. There's lots of contaminated water on earth. But the pure stuff that a human can survive on, that's pretty rare, right? It's one of the rarest things on earth. It should be worth more than gold. Then, of course, you got to have room for this thing to grow. So we could look at that in terms of this thing called square footage, right? And, well, how, how big an area do they need? Well, if you look at the pens that they have, pens that they have down in things like California, if you go towards Redding, where they have huge, you know, basically cow factories, they're cow farms, right? Feedlots is what they're actually called. You'll notice they're all stuck together, and, well, that's because – they're not out roaming where they can eat. They're all stuck together, but the food still comes to them. So you need the footage on earth to actually supply that. And it takes 74.5 square feet just to support that one cow. Now you multiply that times 2000, you get, you know, thousands and thousands and thousands of acres of land. We're talking like thousands to millions of square miles of the United States that are involved in beef production because the food's got to go from that land, growing crops, right, corn, and be shuttled its way to the beef. That's a lot of ground, right? Then, of course, you couldn't do any of this without energy, and most of the energy is in the form of oil, right? So this is petrochemicals, gasoline, oil, to run all the, the factories and stuff like that. In terms of the number of gallons of oil that it takes just to produce that single beef patty, that one pound of beef, that's 0 0.75 gallons of oil. Now, if you think about that, like if you look at the quart bottle that's inside of your, you put in your car, it doesn't seem like a lot, but then you multiply times the 2000 mark, right, for the whole cow, and that's going to come out to a, a whopping, right, 1500 gallons of oil just for the pound of beef. That's some expensive beef, right? It takes a lot of resources to put just that pound of beef together. That's like, you know, four hamburgers. So then if we consider this, that's just going into directly into the beef itself to make the beef, right? Then you got to figure in the fact that you don't just have patties just growing out there and you're, you're sticking them together. They grow up on farms, but it's not like the old days where the farm, you know, like on my farm when I was a kid where we had, we had three cattle at a time maybe. They had uh, this lovely slave labor called their children to lug water down to them in the wintertime and feed them and then they roamed around in the field and the grass would grow because there was enough time that wouldn't make enough money so instead we've got the feedlots the factory system and those feedlots of course are huge mechanized services with lots of motors lots of engines that are running it so that you can you know force feed the cows corn and antibiotics because they get too many infections from being jammed together that they're loaded with antibiotics and that's where antibiotic resistant bacteria come from etc causing other problems right chipotle and um well, after you've grown this cow in this huge lot, you got to recognize that it doesn't just magically turn into a patty. And it's not like you're just going out there and ripping a chunk of beef off the cow. So it's got to go through processing too. And processing plants don't tend to be right next to where they actually grow the cows, but that's okay. We built this huge, you know, highway system to transport nuclear bombs around at the end of World War II. And that interstate highway system allows us to ship those via giant tractor trailers and boxcars on trains to other locations where it's cheaper, like the American South, to process these things, right? Lower wages there. In the processing, of course, you bring in the cow, and the cow doesn't just turn into a patty. First thing you do, of course, is, well, you could use a couple techniques. One, they can put a sledgehammer to its head. That's pretty favored because it's cheap. Or they have this wonderful thing that's set up where the cow's stuck into a little chamber and then a metal bolt goes into their head 
and you send them through. There's also the one where they stick the electrode in the front and the back, you know, up the anus and in the throat, and then shut and send electric shock through. The, the one with the bolts pretty cheap, so they tend to go for that one. You can process them quickly. Then, of course, if you've ever, you know, slaughtered a cow, you'll recognize that slaughtering the cow is not a clean process. I've done it. It's a huge dissection, and when you slice them open, of course, their their intestines will fall out. It's a wonderful aroma, and bacteria could get on the beef. So one thing you have to do with all of these things is, one, you've got to supply the oil to actually run them and the water to clean all those implements and wash them out because you're going to mix that with a whole bunch of, you know, animal feces, blood that has to be decontaminated. So you use a lot of bleach, and then that runs into the water, and that would then continue on to the environment because it's got to flush somewhere, right? Then on top of that, we're not even considering the feed crops. And the primary feed crop here is corn because they're not eating the grass. That would really push up the price. Instead, we're just polishing off the corn on them. And that's all the fertilizers that are involved with the corn and the mass spraying we talked about in the last entry task. But if we look at this, to raise that corn, it's got to have fertilizer. It's got to have herbicides. And most of those things are produced and put onto the crop using mechanization, which means it's running on combustion, oil, right? Or producing the actual fertilizers from oil-based products, the petrochemical energy is industry, the one of the most powerful companies that are out there, industries that's out there, it's many companies, right? Now, if we look at this, it's those few companies that control it, they're doing well because this is going into things like our corn and it takes 284 gallons of oil just to produce the feed crops, the corn to make for the cow, the beef, which means we, we have to add that into this because that's additional fuel. And realize that in the end, of course, all those feed crops are going to need water as well. And the water is going to get contaminated with the fertilizers and the pesticides and, you know, atrazine causes huge problems in reproductive cycles. Or you could look at things like, uh, you know, Roundup and it looks like it causes non-Hodgkin's lymphoma, right? In humans even court cases on it. All of those things, of course, are going to consume this lovely stuff called water, the most precious stuff there is on Earth. And, well, it hasn't been a problem because we've been sucking that out of aquifers for the last, you know, 100 years, if not more, so that now they're starting to dry out in huge parts of the U.S. because it's like the climate's changing from weather pattern shifting from temperature changes. I don't know. It's really weird. In the end, they've calculated it costs about actually 2,500 gallons of water to produce just that beef. We're not talking about the other stuff, just the beef. That is just the beef. Just the meat, right? Imagine what it takes for the, the wheat and the cheese that comes from the dairy, the lettuce that's shipped from places like Alaska, all that salt that's in the ketchup and the bun and all that stuff. Man, that's just the meat. In fact, one of the most expensive, environmentally expensive things and resource intensive, as well as energy, that you can possibly consume in your life is red meat, right? It is one of the worst violators. Now, the other part of this is that what, what goes into this thing. And a little bit about what comes out with the fertilizer, but there's also stuff that comes out of it, right? When you, of course, feed a cow, it's, it's a red meat and it has a high metabolism, so it, it consumes a lot more than things that are, say, lighter in meat. And it also does another thing. If you've ever been down to Enumclaw or a farming area, you'll, you'll notice a certain aroma. And that aroma, of course, is because cows are not that efficient as ruminants in digesting. They use the power of bacteria, but the bacteria in their guts make a lot of this stuff. And they produce, of course, not only a bunch of methane, they produce a lot of organic waste, right? They poop a lot. Now, I remember driving up from California one time and seeing in the distance what I thought was Mount Shasta. I was actually driving south. I got really excited because as I, I drove to this place, Redding, I saw this, this mountain and I thought it was Mount Shasta for the first time. And it turned out that it was actually a feedlot and there was a giant pile of manure the size of a small volcano. And it was steaming. And it was steaming because bacteria was still eating it and producing methane. Now, hopefully you recognize, of course, that methane, as well as the CO2, are greenhouse gases. And this is by far a more powerful greenhouse gas than CO2. It's 
far more powerful in its ability to hold on heat on Earth. It's one of the worst offenders of it. Red meat produces more methane than any other product on Earth. Besides the natural breakdown of oils and things like that, or, you know, the fracking of those when we go and cook them down to things that we want, like motor oil. It is top on the list. If you read any scientific study, though, they'll, they'll reference that studies this, well, they'll reference that it is by far the worst environmental thing that you could do is eat red meat, which is, you know, oh, pretty evident in the numbers. And that's why about 15 years ago now, I cut out red meat entirely. I don't eat beef. I don't buy beef. I refuse to because I care more about, you know, the planet that I enjoy with the wildlife. And there's a side benefit that comes with it. Not only do I not produce all that methane from my consumption of not eating red meat, I don't use up all these resources in the level that would occur with things like red meat. And there's another huge benefit. One of the number one killers of humans in North America is heart disease and arterial sclerosis. And that's because, of course, this fatty, rich meat that tastes so good puts a lot of saturated fats in your your body, which causes you to clog up your little capillaries and arterioles, and then your heart stops and you get a heart attack or, you know, you get high blood pressure and you blow a, a brain clot. So one of the parts of not eating red meat, though I grew up and I know that it tastes good, but I refuse to eat it because I know what a horrible thing it does to the environment, is I also get the chance to be healthier because I'm not loading myself with saturated fats. But am I a vegetarian? No way. I, I have canine teeth. I evolved. My, my guts are medium size. I evolved to eat not only plant matter, but meat. So there's got to be alternatives here because I got to get protein in my body somehow, right? So what kind of food items could I eat? Well, red meat is horrible and wasteful because there's so many mitochondria loaded in it. It takes up so much blood vessels. That's why the cow is so hungry, like all of us mammals. So instead I go for, you know, white meat. And actually white meat like chicken and turkey is far more efficient and less wasteful. That's why they can, you know, survive on such a small diet compared to the cow, right? And the ultimate white meat would be something that doesn't waste most of what it eats as heat. And that would be, of course, cold-blooded animals like fish. A fair number amount of fish and chicken in my diet because it supplies me with the protein I need. And I know that it's far less wasteful. Look at how less wasteful it is. Ultimately, of course, if you really wanted to save the planet, because... Stopping eating red meat is the number one thing you could do right away. And it's pretty easy. It hasn't really hurt my lifestyle. I'm still fit. Is uh, you could go vegetarian, right? Now, you're probably like, no way, dude. I'm not giving up meat. Um, I haven't given up meat completely, but there's three days a week that I don't eat meat. And during the days that I do eat meat, I eat white meat, chicken, fish, or turkey. And by... If I look at our average day, I usually only eat meat during one of those meals because it's like dinner. Because lunch and breakfast, I can eat veggie-based things and be just fine, right? Hmm. Now, to give you some numbers to go with that, one thing we should recognize, of course, is when we talk about the CO2 and methane production, because cows are one of the biggest producers of methane, you can see they make up 32% of those emissions, right? Plus, you got to consider the fertilizer to grow the crops because we don't grow them on grass farms anymore. It costs too much. And the overall running of the farms with all the tractors and giant stuff to make it mechanized and more efficient. And then all those feed crops, right? And the absorption of the greenhouse gases that, that come from those things, right? Hmm. So if we look at this, they're, they're one of the worst things you could do. I'm getting my numbers from a, a National Geographic article that was excellent uh, about two years ago. They set those out, really went into it. I would hope they do it again, right? And greenhouse gas production, to give you an idea, livestock feed beef, meat, basically. It, it is the second only to energy production in its production of greenhouse gases. And that's mainly because, of course, not only are there so many cows and they're belching so much, mostly the burping and a little bit of farting. That's the methane. It's proportionally a larger trap of heat. And there's all the CO2 from the transport of that stuff. I mean, it's only slightly behind all of the cars, planes, trains that are driving around and all the oil that we're refining. Crazy. It's, it's even ahead. This is, this is like coal power plants. It's, a, it's above all the transportation. It's just below the energy production. Freaky, right? It beats out planes, trains, and cars. Apparently, we eat a lot of meat. Yeah.
10 billion burgers sold, right? Now that's because there's a difference in the way things process. If you look at the Western cattle, they're relatively inefficient in the way that they process and how much methane comes back out mainly as belches. Um, they evolve in colder climates and they can be more inefficient. But if you go to the harsher climates like India and Africa, the cows there actually produce less methane because they have to be more efficient in environments that are not as giving, don't have as much grass. And so they have more efficient guts. So if we switch to non-Western cattle, which could really help, that could produce beef with, you know, half the amount of methane productions. Or you could look at sheep, which is a fine meal, or pig. At least bacon, right? Well, most people do, except for other parts of the world. Um, and those that are considered the fact that this pig is still producing, you know, a fair amount of methane, but far less than a cow. And we're not going to eat humans. That's not an option legally, right? Soy went green. So if we look at meat consumption and those that are, of course, the major producers of this methane produced from it, you can see, hey, look, it's the Western world. It's those rich countries that can afford the stuff, plus large amounts of South America because culture is acceptable there. That's why the Amazon and Pampas are disappearing. And the ones who aren't causing this would be like, hey, India. It's almost like a huge population of vegetarian Hindus are not contributing to that. And places like Southern Africa, where folks would love to eat beef, but they're poor, so they can't afford it. So you can really see that this is about a choice. And one interesting thing is how meat consumption has gone up in places like China and throughout the world in recent years because, well, we buy stuff from them. So they're, they're getting more money. And when they have more money, everybody craves meat because it tastes good. I mean, we evolved to crave that stuff, but it could, you know, lead to the warming of the earth and our demise. Uh, good example, of course, is this is a great picture showing how much of the Amazon is being cut down to turn into soy to feed the cows as well as for cattle ranches. So, you know, the more stuff you buy on Amazon, the faster there isn't an Amazon. Hey, that's catchy. Uh, if we look at other solutions, because your project has to do with solutions, there's got to be something biotech you could fix with this, right? And somebody figured out, hey, you could have the meat without the cow. All you do is you take a living cow right? Like dairy cattle, if you want, or some Angus, you take some stem cells from it and you grow them in a Petri dish. You give them all the nutrients that they need directly. That way they don't have to use the bacteria. So they don't produce the methane and they will actually grow and differ differentiate if you turn on certain cell signaling processes, which we learned about this year, and they will turn into a perfect Petri ship shape dish, which looks just like a hamburger and then you put it on a burger and eat it and now they actually have some that are so well designed that people couldn't tell the difference but a lot of people are like freaked out i'm not gonna eat something that grow in a dish how often have you gone and chopped the chunk out of the cow and actually process it yourself because that's even grosser than that and far more wasteful right so how often do you know where your little styrofoam weight container of meat and where it actually came from. If you can't tell the difference, protein's protein, but this could be protein that is far less wasteful with the planet, right? Uh, other ideas, of course, more National Geographic things you can see here that they're showing that uh, 6.8 pounds of feed for one pound of cattle versus 2.9, 1.7 for chickens, and the most efficient, the ectotherm, the fish, because less of what they're eating is turning into heat. They have a slower metabolism. It's like those energy pyramid things we learned are worth something, right? And uh, when we look at that, that means that you got to have more fish. Now, we're decimating the oceans by overfishing, which led some places like in Asia to figure out this thing called aquaculture, which aqua water culture, farming like agriculture, right? This is farming the sea. So throughout Asia, it's very common to have, uh, you know, growing shrimp and fish in pens as well as it's picking up, especially throughout Southeast Asia and China. And it's shown up in a couple places in Europe, like in the salmon fishing, and it just started showing up in the Puget Sound area out here. And that's where you'll see these pins. Now, the tricky part about this is, of course, to do it, they, they tend to bring in Atlantic salmon because they were the most researched, and they've also been genetically engineered to grow faster. And when they hold them in the pins, the problem is they have to feed them with antibiotics because you have a huge population because they could get sick. And all the waste that they create, of course, flows out of this thing which is great for the farmer because then it just goes in the ecosystem but it causes algae blooms as well as you know recently in puget sound the last two years a bunch of pens collapsed in a storm and they all escaped even though they said they wouldn't and some people also came along and cut some to protest it but that means now there's atlantic salmon in the pacific where they shouldn't be the biggest fear factor for this for me 
has to do with this thing called uh, the feed fish. Now, what they do is they go out and they catch smaller fish like sand, sardines and anchovies and lanternfish, and then they shovel them into the big pins to grow the big, oily, yummy fish that we like, the large predators. But that means that they're stealing these small fish from the local ecosystems. It might explain why the oceans are dying. So aquaculture could help feed us, but it's going to starve the ocean if we don't do it right. Um, the other option came out of Colorado, which is kind of cool. It must be all those sunny days. Is uh, one of my favorite fish, and you've probably eaten it because it's popular because it's relatively cheap and tasteless. It's called tilapia. You can make it any flavor you want. Cool thing about tilapia is they're a vegetarian fish. They eat algae, plant matter, right? So this group in Colorado, far from the sea, they're like, well, we want fresh fish. And what they got was some highly technical gear. They got a bunch of kiddie pools. They got some tilapia, a fish from that lives in Asia, Africa, and South America. Very successful fish. And they set up their tanks, and the problem with tilapia is, yeah, you can feed them algae and stuff, and then they'll go and they'll, they'll make waste. They'll make a lot of ammonia and fecal matter, right? So what they did was they created a closed system. Inside of this chamber, they had pipes that came out, brought out all of their nitrogen and fecal matter, the organic matter, and they fed it into other tanks, which then had bacteria in it, which converted it, nitrified it, so that it became, of course, nitrates that they then gave to these things called algae. And then they piped the algae back in with the water that's now cleaned by the bacteria. And they created this beautiful cycle that's a lot like a natural wetland ecosystem. And then the algae came back and fed the fish. And then they grew the fish up in the mountains far from the sea. And they didn't waste a lot of water because they created a closed system. Now, on the small scale, it's it's not enough to, you know, be cheap enough to feed the world. But if you could set this up in your backyard like I'm planning on doing, or, you know, we could industrialize this, this could supply enough protein at a far greater reduction in waste. And they did it with kiddie pools, right? Plus, beauty of tilapia, if you not try it, it's, a rel it's much cheaper than things like salmon and stuff. And you can make it any flavor you want. I like to do curries with it. Uh the ultimate would be, of course, if you're a vegan, thank you very much. If you're a vegetarian, you are planet savers. Thank you so much. If we look at this, I tip my hat to you because your water saving alone gives the story. Look at a portion of beef versus a portion of chicken versus a vegan meal where you're eating rice, broccoli, and lettuce. This is just for the chicken and the beef, right? You don't get all the things along with it. You can see that plants are far more efficient because they're not warm-blooded, so they're not wasting a lot of their energy. So that means a lot of it returns to you, not only water savage, but all the oil saving that goes with it. And no methane production. Whoa. Uh, that, of course, is just numbers. And you can see this graph as you think about how you're setting up your eco project. To recognize you've got to figure out how to make this so that it relates to people. So it's an analogy. You've got to scar your audience. So here's another way of looking at it. Here's this one little drop of oil versus 16 times the amount for the same chunk of beef six ounces which is far less food and far less flavor you can also see of course there's the 0.4 pounds of the co2 something that americans can feel and then there's the 10 pounds of co2 25 times as much for the beef or you can relate it to something they can think about like um oh thriving right so if we look at things like potatoes to grow a potato in the co2 production you can go 0.17 miles to do that for you know beef equal amount of beef it's 9.81 miles. That's a lot further. I mean, that's how much you could save if you chose the taters instead of the beef, right? Meat not that green. The ultimate thing that we could see, of course, is the big concern about beef, besides its consumption of natural resources, is its output is a huge amount of methane. That's because, of course, as they evolved, they evolved to burp off the gas that came from the bacteria. It is the number one contributor of methane on Earth. And methane release is what very much caused the Permian extinction as huge bubbles of it came out. Oh, you should eat more chicken and less cow. It's called the cow apocalypse. Apocalypse cow. Great movie. A little less creepy than the other one, but just as tragic, right? So that, of course, brings us to what we normally be doing in class, which is dissecting fetal pigs. Now, why are we dissecting pigs when we're talking about not eating meat? Um... Well, one thing is we can't dissect humans. It's too expensive. But maybe you will in college. It's kind of quite fun. Uh, you learn a lot, right? But you can notice with that little, little meat bag that's right there, hey, he is a placental mammal. 
and he's got a belly button, and so does this guy. These are eutherian mammals, and their organ systems work a lot like ours. That's why we're going to use them. And how can we dissect fetal pigs if we're talking about not eating meat? Well, the good news is these fetal pigs would have died anyways because they were the byproduct of bacon production. And how do you make a female pig grow a lot more fat under its skin? Well, you know, pregnant ladies will put on weight so they can feed their babies. That's more fat under the skin. Same thing for pigs. So with cows that we want to produce more milk or pigs that we want to produce more bacon, hey, you get them pregnant. And then the byproduct, fortunately, we can recycle and reuse to learn about knowledge. That's fetal pigs. So, uh, Unfortunately, we won't get to do it in person, but uh, we'll in future years. And with the Ethereum pig, you can see they've got all the features of us. The umbilical is a pretty coarse, cool structure. Hog tying, we tie them down, and then we'd open up their mouth and take a look at their salivary glands. You can see they have these cool papillae. They're fungi form. They're shaped like fungi for grabbing onto the mom's teeth. They also have the hard palate and the ridge because with a mammal, that separates your breathing. You can breathe at the same time you feed. It gives you a huge advantage over reptiles, right? That's why we can be so active. They're born with canine teeth and incisors because they can, you know, search around and find food right away, unlike you that just sat there going, ah, mommy. Also be able to see things like their salivary glands for releasing things like amylase to break down starches and look at their cool eyes that are just starting to, of course, open and develop. As we cut them open, you would find on the inside all the major organs that look a lot like ours, like this beautiful diaphragm, because unlike the frog, they've got a separated system and huge expansive lungs with tons and tons of alveoli to increase the pressure. We'd be able to see things like the thymus gland, where T cells are formed, right? Part of your immune system, the thyroid for controlling your metabolism, the lungs we would have blown up. You can see on the heart things like the coronary artery and the four chambers, just like ours. The liver would be there in its major changing and processing center. We'd be able to see things like the scrambled eggs, which is that beautiful pancreas that controls so much of so many different systems from endocrine to digestive, right? And the spleen, the recycling center of things like red blood cells, the good old, because they got to go somewhere. I don't want to pop that thing in a car accident, right? And my favorite by far is when you open it up and you can see things inside of the small intestines, you'll see this beautiful rainbow with the injections. That, of course, is the mesenteric arteries and the capillary system that feeds all that and takes the nutrients and sends them to your body. And then their kidneys, those beautiful filter systems that do so much. Whatever you do, unlike the one student that I had before, I won't say his name here, don't dissect with your mouth open ever because, you know, bile does not taste that good when you pop a gallbladder. Right, Graham? Oh, I said his name. Cool. If we look at this, of course, your uh, job right now is to get submitted to me the three topics. Hopefully you already did it that you we're putting as your first choices. You only get one. Hopefully nobody else has chosen it. Topics are there for your eco issues project. And you're going to be making your screencast of five video of uh, what you would present to the president or any powerful individual if you wanted to convince them of what was going on if you were stuck in an elevator and nobody coughed for a while, right? And your Google presentation will answer all the other questions that are on there. Our target today was to make sure that we understood the price of meat. And meat, of course, is one of the most expensive. By far, red meat is the most environmentally horrible things that you can do in terms of resources consumed, as well as things like uh, how much methane comes out of it. That's why I cut it out of my diet, and uh, I'm just practicing what I preach here, people, because uh, I want the planet to survive, and one of the best things you can do by far is reduce the amount of meat you eat. Try, try going vegetarian for one day a week. And maybe like me, you'll find out, mm, one day wasn't bad. Try two. Oh, three. If you can go past that and go fully veg, I tip my hat to you because you're saving the planet that we all rely on and survive because of, right? Thanks.